Hello, Iman Brawe here. Uh, in today's video, I, I just want to share with you how I practice my English pronunciation. And I still practice to this day. So without further ado, uh, let's take a look at the screen. So this is how I practice my English pronunciations. Uh, I have the writ written version. I have the audiobook and also have the written version of this. Uh, in this example, I'll show you... Uh, I show you this. This is a storybook. It's, this is a children story. It's, this is a children book by Roald Dahl. And it is read by uh, Kate Winslet in British accent. But I'm not going to use the British accent because I still cannot uh, speak with British accent. I don't know. It's kind of hard for me to really like mimicking uh, the way uh, Kate Winslet uh read this it's amazing this is really amazing in in reading this uh book proud parents but they usually get their own back and uh usually i use like audacity to really uh it is really a grateful uh a helpful tools because you can really like uh highlight the phrase or the things that you really want to practice for example here some parents go further some parents and then you can really like uh highlight this one and make it just uh play that highlight some parents go further okay some parents go further some parents some parents go further some parents go further some parents go further some parents go further and then if you want to really like close here in this thing they become so blinded by adoration they become so blind. I want to just highlight this first, for example, and then this is how I how I done. They become so. They become so. They become so, and then I can really like play loop this over and over again. They become so. They become so. They become so. They become so. So, uh, audacity is really a helpful tools to really practice your pronunciation, but it is uh, this process really tedious tedious you know it's really like it's hard for me to do like every single you don't like try to read all the book and then i try with one paragraph or the first uh, when i first try uh my when i first try practicing my pronunciation i still i kind of like just practice one sentence over and over and over again it's really tedious so you have to you really have to uh, have a strong intention why you want to practice your pronunciation so uh, today i just gonna read this but w when before i read this uh, let's hear how kate winslet read this qualities of genius well there is nothing very wrong with all this it's the way of the world. It is only when the parents begin telling us about the brilliance of their own revolting offspring that we start shouting, bring us a basin, we're going to be sick. Okay, I will try to read this, but with my version, not with British accent like her. Okay, bismillahirrahmanirrahim. The reader of books. It's a funny thing about mothers and fathers. Even when their own child is the most disgusting little blister you could ever imagine, they still think that he or she is wonderful. Some parents go further. They become so blinded by the reason they manage to convince themselves their child has qualities of genius. Well, there is nothing very wrong with all this. It's the way of the world. It is only when the parents begin telling us about the brilliance of their own revolting offspring that we start shouting. Bring us a basin. We're going to be sick. School teacher, school teachers suffer a good deal from having to listen to this sort of twaddle from proud parents, but they usually get their own back when the time comes to write the end of term reports. If I were a teacher, I would cook up some real scorchers for the children of doting parents. Your son, Maximilian, I would write, is a total washout. I hope you have a family business you can push him into when he leaves school because he sure as heck won't get a job anywhere else. 
Or if I were feeling lyrical that day, I might write, It is a curious truth that grasshoppers have their hearing organs in the side of the abdomen. Your daughter, Vanessa, judging by what she's learned this term, has no hearing organs at all. I might even delve deeper into natural history and say, the periodical cicada spends six years as a grub underground and no more than six days as a free creature of sunlight and air. Your son, Wilfred, has spent six years as a grub in the school and we are still waiting for him to emerge from the chrysalis. A particularly poisonous little girl might sting me into saying, Fiona has the same glacial beauty as an iceberg, but unlike the iceberg, she has absolutely nothing below the surface. I think I might enjoy writing an off-term report for the stinkers in my class. But enough of that. We have to get on. Occasionally, one comes across parents who take the opposite line, who show no interest at all in their children, and these, of course, are far worse than the doting ones. Mr. and Mrs. Wormwood were two such parents. They had a son called Michael and a daughter called Matilda, and the parents looked upon Matilda in particular as nothing more than a scab. A scab is something you have to put up with until the time comes when you can pick it off and flick it away. Mr. and Mrs. Wormwood looked forward enormously to the time when they could pick their little daughter off and flick her away, preferably into the next county or even further than that. It is bad enough when parents treat ordinary children as though they were scouts and bunions, but it becomes somehow a lot worse when the child in question is extraordinary, and by that I mean sensitive and brilliant. Matilda was both of these things, but above all, She was brilliant. Her mind was so nimble, and she was so quick to learn that her ability should have been obvious, even to the most half-witted of parents. But Mr. and Mrs. Wormwood were both so gormless and so wrapped up in their own silly little lives that they failed to notice anything unusual about their daughter. To tell the truth, I doubt they would have noticed had she crawled into the house with a broken leg. Matilda's brother was a perfectly normal boy, but the sister, as I said, was something to make your eyes pop. By the age of one and a half, her speech was perfect, and she knew as many words as most grown-ups. The parents, instead of applauding her, called her a noisy chatterbox and told her sharply that small girls should be seen and not heard. By the time she was three, Matilda had taught herself to read by studying newspapers and magazines that lay around the house. At the age of four, she could read fast and well, and she naturally began hankering after books. The only book in the whole of this enlightened household was something called Easy Cooking, belonging to her mother, and when she had read this from cover to cover, and had learned all the recipes by heart, she decided she wanted something more interesting. Daddy, she said. Do you think you could buy me a book? A book? He said. What do you want a Fleming book for? To read Tete. What's wrong with the tally for heaven's sake? We've got a lovely tally with a 12-inch screen, and now you come asking for a book? You're getting spoiled, my girl. Nearly every weekday afternoon, Matilda was left alone in the house. Her brother, five years older than her, went to school. Her father went to work and her mother went out playing bingo in a town eight miles away. Mrs. Wormwood was hooked on bingo and played five afternoons a week. On the afternoon of the day when her father had refused to buy her a book, Matilda set out all by herself to walk to the public library in the village. When she arrived, she introduced herself to the librarian, Mrs. Phelps. She asked if she might sit a while and read a book. Mrs. Phelps, lightly taken aback at the arrival of such a tiny girl unaccompanied by a parent, nevertheless told her she was very welcome. Where are the children's book, please? Matilda asked. They're over there on those lower shelves, Mrs. Phelps told her. Would you like me to help you find a nice one with lots of pictures in it? No, thank you, Matilda said. I'm sure I can manage. From then on, every afternoon, as soon as her mother had left for bingo, Matilda would toddle down to the library. 
The walk took only 10 minutes, and this allowed her two glorious hours sitting quietly by herself in a cozy corner, devouring one book after another. When she had read every single children's book in the place, she started wandering round in search of something else. Mrs. Phelps, who had been watching her with fascination for the past few weeks, now got up from her desk and went over to her. And went over to her. Can I help you, Matilda? She asked. I'm wondering what to read next, Matilda said. I've finished all the children's books. You mean you've looked at the pictures? Yes, but I've read the books as well. Mrs. Phelps looked down at Matilda from her great height. And Matilda looked right back up at her. I thought some were very poor, Matilda said, but others were lovely. I liked the secret garden best of all. It was full of mystery, the mystery of the room behind the closed door, and the mystery of the garden behind the big wall. Mrs. Phelps was stunned. Exactly, how old are you, Matilda? She asked. Four years and three months. Matilda said, "Mrs. Phelps was more stunned than ever, but she had the sense not to show it. What short of a book would you read to read? What short of a book would you like to read next?" she asked. Matilda said, "I would like a really good one that grown grown ups read. A famous one. I don't know any names." Mrs. Phelps looked along the shelves, taking her time. She didn't quite know what to bring out. How she asked herself, does one choose a famous grown-up book for a four-year-old girl? Her first thought, her first thought, was to pick a young teenager's romance of the kind that is written for fifteen-year-old girls, but for some reason she found herself instinctively walking past that particular shelf. Try this, she said at last. It's very famous and very good. If it's too long for you, just let me know, and I'll find something shorter. And a bit easier. Great expectation, Matilda read. By Charles Dixon. I love to try it. I must be mad, Mrs. Phelps tore, told herself. But to Matilda, she said, "Of course you may try." Over the next few afternoons, Mrs. Phelps could hardly take her eyes from the small girl sitting for hour after hour in the big armchair at the far end of the room with the book on her lap. It was necessary to rest. It on the lap because it was too heavy for her to hold up, which meant she had to sit leaning forward in order to read. And a strange, and a strange sight it was: this tiny, dark-haired person sitting there, with her feet nowhere near touching the floor, totally absorbed in the wonderful adventure of Peep and Old Miss Havisham and her cobweb and her cobweb house, and by the spell of magic that Dickens, the great storyteller, had woven with his words. The only movement from the reader was the lifting of hand, every now and then to turn over a page, and Mrs. Phelps always felt sad when the time came for her to cross the floor and say, "It's ten to five, Matilda." During the first week of Matilda's visits, Mrs. Phelps had said to her, "Does your mother walk you home here every day and then take you home?" "My mother goes to Aspery every afternoon to play bingo," Matilda had said. "She doesn't know I come here." But that's surely not right," Mrs. Phelps said. "I think you'd better ask her." "I'd rather not," Matilda said. "She doesn't encourage reading books, nor does my father." "But what do they expect you to do every afternoon in an empty house? Just mooch around and watch the telly." "I see." "She doesn't really care what I do," Matilda said a little sadly. Okay, so I guess that's all for now. Uh, just for try to practicing my reading, and I maybe uh I will also when I when I'm ready to read all of this, I will also try to read it uh again from start to finish, maybe chapter by chapter. But because I'm right here, just in the uh in the sense of practicing. Uh, and maybe you can really like uh, see how I practice my pronunciation. It's really n- not perfect, but uh, what I what I felt is day by day it is increasing. So I I think that's all for now. I talk to you soon and bye now.